ti dimentichi dei poveri. E quella parola, parola è entrata qui. I poveri, i poveri. Everything that you did to the smallest of my brothers, you did for me. This is what animates everything that I do. So we want to get everybody over the social foundation into the green donut ring itself. Nobody left behind in the hole is the need to distribute the capacity to generate wealth. And again, thank you, Sophie, for this beautiful, <laughs> beautiful image of capturing. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure and honor to have Professor Sachs with us. So thank you for being here. It's important to start with the ancients, uh, with the Greeks, uh, and with the ideas of happiness and to understand how the message from the ancient Greeks, from Jesus uh, at the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you again, Professor Capra. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here to enhance the good growth and diminish the bad growth. Now, from an ecological point of view, this distinction between good growth and bad growth is obvious. As I said in my presentation, that This idea of unlimited growth on a finite planet is completely irrational. Come agisce anche in quei paesi, viste le esigenze differenti, eh, il movimento di sviluppo? Grazie a te, perché questo mi dà l'opportunità di mettere in evidenza una questione molto importante. Eh, la lente di ingrandimento, il tema della ricoltura. Con la tua produzione si cerca la qualità, la quantità rispetto alla qualità. Eh, siamo arrivati a una situazione insostenibile, veramente non è più possibile pensare che questo sistema alimentare possa continuare a fare tanti danni. Dei So let me start. We must create economic value, we must create employment, we must reduce environmental risk, we must reduce pandemic risk, we must be richer of time, and we must be a richer sense of life because our goal of civil economics is generative the sense of life. Yes. I'm also great to be part of the um, part of the economy of Francesco. I'm very happy to be. Um, I have quite to the very interesting work. I think it's really important to be good. So for me it's very interesting to be here today together with you and as you can see a very interesting group of speakers. Blueprint is a charity that essentially shows a pathway to build good at scale. The human development that comes about because of what we do in business and because of the kind of contribution. So here's my question. Uh, what have been the challenges that you have experienced to create this new mindset of relationship? That we don't actually have to attract the late majority, that we just have to get to a certain tipping point, which I believe is somewhere around 15 or 18% of adoption in society of, of ideas, of technology. Hello everybody, uh, uh, I'm Vittorio Pelligra, I am one of the coordinator of the Business in Peace Village and I'm extremely happy to welcome you to this first uh, 
on live seminar organized by our uh, village. So welcome, welcome everybody. Um, before going to the to the earth of the of the seminar, just few um, uh, uh, few few notes. Uh, um, uh, this seminar is being translated in different languages: in Italian, in Spanish, and Portuguese. And you can find all the links in the YouTube channel. So go to the YouTube channel, and you will find there the links to to your um, to your language. Here will be in uh, uh, the discussion will be uh, in English. Um, there will be also a, a way to um, make some questions or comments using the uh, the chat in the YouTube channel, or for those who are using Zoom here in the uh, in uh, in the Zoom chat. Um, I don't want to 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 take uh, much time. I want to welcome our uh, speakers. I'm very happy to uh, to have today uh, very two, three very distinguished uh, speakers: uh, Juan Camilo Cardenas and uh, Raúl Caruso and uh, Bernard Sellas. Uh, just a few words to introduce our our speaker uh, to today. Um, Juan Camilo Cardenas is uh, is uh, a uh, professor of economics at the University de los Andes in, uh, in Bogota, and he holds a PhD from University of Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts Harmerst in environmental and resource economics. Um, I think he also has done work with uh, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, uh, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in, in, in economics, uh, uh, very well known for her work on uh, on the uh, on the commons on the the, the, the common goods and uh, and in fact the the the, the work and the uh, scientific interest of uh, um, Juan Camilo are uh, very close to 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 these you know aspects. Uh, he's interested in the analysis and design of institutions that promote cooperation among individuals and the solution of social dilemmas. Um, to find the most fair, efficient, equitable, democratic, and sustainable manners to solve all those social dilemmas, uh, uh, small and large, I think, uh, that we face in, in every day's uh, uh, life in the economic sphere, but also in the political one and the social one. So uh, social dilemmas are everywhere, as, as we know. Uh, so thank you, Juan Camilo, to, to, to join us today. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Raul Caruso. Raul is professor of peace economics at the University of uh, Catholic University of Sacred Heart in Milan, and uh, is professor uh, in, in Milan. But is also uh, editor of the uh, specialized journal, scientific journal, peace economics, peace science, and public policy. And it's also uh, director of the CESPIC, which is the um, European side. He has been, I think, for 10 years, if I'm right. Or you still, okay, you, you still are, you know, you still are the director of the CESPIC, uh, which is the center, European Center for uh, Peace Science, Integration and Cooperation. Okay. You've been director of you know, from 90, from 2009 and to 2019, uh, executive director of the NEPS, which is the network of European peace scientists. Okay, good. <laughs> Long CV, and uh, uh, but very significant for our, you know, our uh, discussion today, and but for the work of our of our village. And we'll, we we are very happy to have. Uh, uh, a discussion today from Spain, from Barcelona, Bernard Sellas Gomez, and he's a um, uh, philosopher, but also an economist. He's professor of history of economic thoughts at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. Um, uh, we uh, we agreed to organize this uh, this uh, uh, about one hour that we have. Uh, uh, for us uh, in, uh, in different moments, uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, presentation uh, from our uh, two main speakers, Juan Camilo and then, then uh, Raul, and then uh, Bernard will 
you know, comments, uh, make questions about the, the, the two presentations, and uh, then there will be time for a Q&A from the audience. So if you want to, uh, to ask something to our, uh, to our speakers, you can use uh, the chats, uh, as I said, as I said before. Uh, this is uh, uh, the first seminar on, on life seminar organized by our villages. So it will be, I think, a extremely useful uh, occasion to uh, highlight some important themes that we can work on in the in the in the coming months uh, towards the, the 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 event in november the assisi event in november so uh, it will be um, yeah, important i think to take note of the main uh, um, uh, i can say the main theoretical and empirical and uh, problematic aspects of the uh, of the peace economics, uh, um, things that we can go deeper on in uh, in the in the future in the future months. So I don't want to take uh, more time, and I give the floor to Juan Camilo for his presentation. Thank you again. Thank you, Vittorio, and thanks for this invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here with Bernard and with Raúl to have this conversation. I will try to keep this as short as possible so that we can allow some time for a conversation with the four of us and with the questions from the, from the audience. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, talking from this side of the world in Colombia, um, uh, a country that has had tough times and hopefully promising times regarding peace and regarding building peace in a country that has had a um, very, harmful uh, histories of, of, of war, internal conflict, and, and hopefully some ideas here will emerge from, from this conversation. I am going to, to share some notes with you. Um, so let me see if I can start here uh, my presentation. And with that, I will share my screen with you. And I think it should work this way. Um, so now you should be seeing my screen, right? Yeah, great. And um, so I want to, 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 to develop four points very quickly linked with the idea on how peace and trust connect and what the role of business could be uh, in this regard. Uh, in a moment in which the economy is shuffled, is shaken around the world because of the pandemic, and, and eventually, uh, when we get out of this, we might end up with, with a promising view of how relationships can be built through trust to build a, a more peaceful environment for, for society in general. And, and for that, I'm going to, to, to mention this through an argument of four basic points. Um, first of all, we need to make a reconceptualization. Uh, we need to redefine peace. Um, and the proposal that I have here, uh, which is um, an idea that I took precisely from uh, Elinor Ostrom, my mentor, and her husband, Vincent Ostrom, and I will mention a little bit more of this that Victoria mentioned, uh, because we, this was a raw idea that was not developed, and in fact, they didn't write it at the time, and unfortunately, they, they passed away in my, in my uh, perception very early on. And the idea is to think of universal goods. Um, peace usually has been seen in many settings as an issue of security. I have come from a, um, I come from a country that has had a period of violence of decades and decades of internal conflict. And the last three decades have been a, a, a tense discourse, a political discourse between seeing security as the main goal of uh, the country to get out of this country. And that notion of peace and security has had some dividends. Um, definitely um, a, a tough strategy by some governments in the past of seeing peace and security uh, decrease dramatically kidnappings, which at a time were one of the tragedies of this country. Um, it decreased killings and massacres. It decreased major events of violence. But my idea is to propose a reconceptualization of peace 
as tranquility. Um, and I will, I will develop more of this idea of why we need to transit from peace as security as peace as tranquility. And this is uh, something that I wrote in a piece that is in Spanish that I can share with people if they, if they want. From that, I want to develop the idea of universal goods. And by universal goods, I mean goods where the more I consume, I enjoy more. It produces the consumption of this good produces me well-being, but the more others around me consume this good, the more well-being I derive. And this is going to be different from private goods, from public goods, from common pool goods. So this idea of universal goods was hinted by the Ostroms because it was by both of them. And, and unfortunately, it wasn't written, but I participated in a seminar and uh, with them during one year that I spent with them in Indiana University. And it kept in my mind this idea that I want to, to propose here as an idea of connecting peace as tranquility as a universal good. And the third point is that to reach that point in which we build peace as tranquility, we need to create trustful relationships. And trust requires two or more players, and we require that some of them create trust and the others are trustworthy. And this I will apply to the idea of businesses in the relationship that businesses have with their clients, with their workers, with their neighbors, with their suppliers. And that would be the four points that I want to pose here for the conversation. So with, with those four points, let me go to the notion of universal goods. The idea of universal goods, as I mentioned, came about in a seminar in 1999. So um, they, what happened in Indiana University in the workshop that the Ostroms built, um, is that they had one year seminar for the postdocs and the visiting scholars. And I had the fortune to spend one year there with working with them. And they had a micro semester and a macro semester on institutional analysis. And during those two seminars, Vincent Ostrom and, and Lynn Ostrom mentioned this idea of universal goods. And, and I was puzzled because themselves, they had worked with this typology of private goods, common pool resource goods, tall goods, private goods. So private, public, common, tall goods were the common typology that we were seeing in the literature and depending on what externalities are involved, what exclusion rules are involved and so on. But the idea of universal goods was posed by them here as this idea that the more others around me consume this good, the better I feel, the more well-being I derive. If you want to call it utility, the more utility I derive. So the consumption of others increases my own utility. And this is key to the point of peace. And you will see how in a second. And I want to contrast that with the traditional way of looking at other goods. So for example, private goods. Private goods, usually my own consumption derives utility on me. My well-being increases on my own consumption. And that's it. In, in, in the idea of private goods, only what I consume is what I what generates well-being on me, utility on me, and that's it. And these are private goods that are usually traded through the market. And, and the markets are very good at producing these goods and uh, setting the right prices for these goods and making demand and, su and supply meet with each other and find the, the right amounts and the right prices for, for these private goods. With public goods, it's different because with public goods, we have the problem that uh, and I say the problem because this might uh, create incentives for free riding. The problem with public goods is that these public goods uh, have the problem that my own consumption doesn't decrease the consumption of others, which is, which is okay. The others can consume this uh, without my consumption harming that consumption. But the problem is that who is going to provide these public goods? Somebody has to provide it. And the textbook solution is the state. And then came again the Ostrom saying, well, the, the communities um, through other means of self-governance can provide also public goods. And we have also the common pool resource goods. The common goods have the problem that they share with the private goods, which is my consumption decreases the availability of the resource for the others, but also I cannot exclude others from consuming this good. And that's the case on common pool resources. Environmental goods are in general the best example of this, water. I consume water, less water is available for others, but I cannot exclude others of using the water that I use from the same creek, the same river, the same lake, right? Now, with that in mind, the idea of, of the universal goods 
is again, that if this good is produced in a way that many people around me in my community, my neighborhood, my ecosystem, enjoy this good collectively, more well-being is created for others. And this is different from public goods. This is different from common pool resource goods and definitely from private goods. Um, because the idea is that the more they benefit around me, the more I derive from my own enjoyment of this good. And notice the idea is to connect this to peace. And I think that's the key point with peace. Peace is something that needs to be enjoyed collectively. There is not much potential for me enjoying peace myself because I have the means to protect myself against violence if others around me are not benefiting from that that I call security, right? So I end up even excluding others from benefiting from this idea of security. And this is why I propose that we transition from peace as security to peace as tranquility. And in tranquility, I mean, we enjoy it collectively. So this idea of universal goods can be useful to understand that if I build an environment of tranquility and I enjoy it collectively with others, it's more like a universal good. It's not a private good. It's not even a common pool resource good. It's not a public good because the more the others enjoy peace, the more I enjoy peace. And this is because of the altruistic and solidarity nature of humans. And there's enough documentation to, to say from neuroscience, from anthropological evidence, from all kinds of disciplines who have shown how we are social beings that enjoy the well-beings of others. We derive utility when others increase their own well-being. And that's the point of, of seeing peace as tranquility, which I think is more progressive, is more equitable, whereas in the case of peace as security is more regressive because with peace as security, it means in many cases excluding others. And those others excluded are those who have no means to provide peace as security for them. And that would be the point of thinking of universal goods for peace. Now the point of trust, and, and I am beginning to, to connect now the dots. The idea of trust has been around for many, many years. Ken Arrow worked about this in the 70s. And, and, and in many texts, he, he was arguing as in this text that basically any transaction in, in, in the economy requires a minimum level of trust. And, and, and this, is, this is not new. Trust has been around in many ways, even from Adam Smith in the origins of how social relationships need to be uh, built in terms of sympathy towards others that require trust. The point is that with trust, we need to expose ourselves to the risk of others taking advantage of us. And this is key in the problem of peace. Because in, in, in the problem of violence, we are exposing ourselves to others that can exert a lot of violence on us. And building trust in a context of violence is very difficult. And I don't have to prove this to you coming from a country like Colombia that has, has suffered so much about an internal conflict that it seems to be endless. And still today we're struggling even after an, a peace agreement with the oldest guerrilla that has survived in the, in the modern times in, in history. And yet the idea of trust is key here. Let me show this with the classical example of the trust game. In the trust game, we have two players, player one and player two. We give 10 euros to each of these players. This is exactly how we do it in reality and with actual money. $10 to each, and we ask player one, okay, how much of your 10 euros you want to send to player two? And whatever amount you send to player two is going to be tripled. Now player two receives three times what player one sent, and player two has that triple amount plus the 10 original euros, and now player two needs to decide how much to send back to player one, right? And Two, que two questions emerge of that. The, the, the first one is, why send any money? There's no binding contract with, between these two people. And we organized the experiment, we organized this game so that they cannot write a binding contract. It's all open to the possibility that player one sends money, player two keeps all that money, and player two doesn't send any money back to player one. So player one is exposed to the abuse of player two. So why sending money? 
but the opposite equation is equally valid. Why not? Player one can send money, triple that money. Now we have, let's say player one sends all 10 euros. Now player two has 30 euros plus the 10 euros originally, that's 40 euros. And then player two can send back to player one, let's say half, and now the two players have 20 euros and 20 euros instead of 10 euros and 10 euros. And that's creating value. And why I use this example? Because my point here is that when we think of businesses, of firms who have relationships with their neighbors, with their environment, with their clients, with their workers, with their suppliers, they are playing this game all the time. They are playing this game all the time. And depending on how they build these trustful relationships between each other, they can create value. And that creation of value, and in the case of the creation of trust, so that lower transaction costs are required. So you don't need so many legal arrangements to try to secure the relationships because you have a trustful relationship with one supplier, with a certain client, with your neighbors, with your workers, then you can reduce the transaction costs and you create an environment in which this flows rapidly. And the reason I build this is because in a context of violence, and again, this is what happens in my country, this that you're seeing in the screen is surrounded by a context of violence by different actors and a, and a, and a notion of insecurity and creating trustful relationships to create this universal good that we may call peace, peace as tranquility, may be a way of creating value for everyone. But for that, we need to create trust with the others. And in businesses, in firms, we all the time are facing these tensions between trusting or not others in a context of violence. So to me, that's the, 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 the four arguments that I am setting here for the conversation in which if we think of peace as tranquility, as a universal good, and we build trust with people, with interactions, then we can create a more productive environment and a more equitable environment and hopefully a more sustainable environment. So I will leave it there for, for the next uh, point in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Camilo. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, you touched very key uh, argument here, the environment of trust, and uh, that you left us with the curiosity to understand how to build <laughs> an environment of trust. You know, the, the transition is the is the main uh, the main uh, point here and uh that we will leave you know space for uh going going deeper on on this uh now raul it's your time please if you can uh juan camilo if okay yes, if you can, yes stop the the, the sharing uh, raul so, your turn. thanks thanks vittorio good afternoon to everybody I'm uh, happy to be here uh, and uh, I must say that I'm in a very difficult position now because speaking after the brilliant uh, uh, talk by Juan Camilo now is even more difficult. So I hope to fulfill the expectation in, in this respect. Uh, now, even I particularly liked his talk even because there will be, there are uh, linkages with what I'm going to say. Uh, so I also share my screen, just a moment. Here it is. Okay. First of all, oh, sorry. First of all, we need the definition of what is peace economics. What is peace in economic terms, okay? Uh, and basically, this is the first linkage with uh, Camilo, with Juan Camilo talks, because peace is a global public good, but in itself is also an institution. What does it mean? It means that uh, it's nothing but a set of rules governing the, some human behaviors, okay? In this respect, we share the idea of institution, a set of rules as uh, Douglas North, the Nobel graduate, has introduced years, years ago in economics. And uh, in particular, Douglas North, the, the, the famous Nobel graduate, uh, released a book a few years ago 
uh, highlighting uh, uh, a basic concept. The, the main problem of the institution of the humankind is, uh, is the problem of uh, handling violence. If we reverse this definition, basically we could say that uh, peace uh, is nothing but this, and peace economy is nothing but the study of how institutions, uh, their interrelation, their design are able to solve any type of violent conflicts, latent or actual violence within and between societies. I, uh, um, the definition you can see on the slide is by myself and a colleague of mine, but uh, I must say that perhaps now I have to integrate this with the idea of uh, the universal good expounded by Juan Camilo. I have to think about that. But basically this is a piece in my perspective is a, is a matter of institution because uh, it's nothing but a set of uh, a comprehensive set of rules governing behaviors of individuals, of firms, of governments, and all the economic agents we have, okay? And in particular, what is the long-term objective of such institution? Uh, well, or better, what is the long-term outcome of peace in economic terms? Uh, in economic terms, is a stable prosperity and product longer, uh, long run prosperity and long run productivity growth, in the sense that the outcome of peace is nothing but the capacity uh, is the capacity to give the societies the societies stability in the long run through economic means removing roots of violent conflict so basically in this uh, in this perspective peace economics is uh, sounds really like economics but with the only difference is that uh, as a different target variable. In the neoclassical uh, conventional economics, the target variable is the, the growth GDP. With peace economics, and uh, uh, um, our colleagues, many of our colleagues believe, many colleagues of ours believe that peace and security is nothing but a spillover of GDP growth. As a peace economist, we reverse this. We say that the peace is the final objective and prosperity, economic growth, economic development are nothing but an instrument to reach peace. So first of all, a workable definition. Uh, we still need maybe a, a rich version of this, uh, of this, uh, of this definition. And uh, in particular would be really a Copernican revolution for economists because even if you look at the codification of economics worldwide, we don't have a code for peace economics. We have a code for conflict economics, for uh, public spending and military spending, but we don't have a code of peace economics. So we need a really a reversal, a reversal of thinking about that. The second point. So we know that economics is related to to macro variables like you know unemployment, inflation, and uh, public spending operated by by governments and other public authorities and the microeconomics. So basically behavior, behavior of uh, individuals. So let's keep um, the attention to macro, macroeconomics aspect first. The first, because of macro, we know that there's nothing but the framework, the framework where in the um, micro behaviors take place. So the first thing we have to consider is that uh, whether peace uh, is the capacity, um, the cap economic capacity to handle uh, with the, to limit violence, the first topic of a peace economic is uh, the study and then eventually the control, if possible, military expenditures and the cost of violence. Most people in the world are not aware of actual costs of violence but not solely of actual violence, but even of potential violence. Uh, most people don't realize, in my, in my country, Italy, but everywhere in the world, people believe that, that if you push some public money into military spending, there will be some positive spillover for uh, economic growth. There is no research that shows this. 
this is a kind of fake news, fake news in, uh, in, in scientific research. It's the, the opposite is true, okay? So the first challenge we have is that we have to, every, every time I give you a public talk, I introduce this point and say, I am aware that 95% of people in this room don't, don't agree with me. Because it's something, because we have, a, we have a military imprinting in our mindset. Okay, we have to change. We have the challenge is to change this footprint, military, military, military's footprint in our mindset. So first of all, we have to be aware of what is the economic cost of violence. I mean, I'm happy that Juan Camilo is here because he is the, in Colombia is the example that after the, the peace agreement, the Colombian economy is booming. I mean, Colombia cannot, cannot change in a few years, right? But in three years, the economic figures are booming, you know, after, after the treaty. This is a, is a natural experiment. Second point, the point is uh, been already introduced by Camilo uh, again, is about which sectors do create incentives of conflict. In this respect, this is a, uh, this is a, 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 a path-breaking uh, point of view because uh, uh, let's make a simple example. We know that many conflict, violent conflicts worldwide are generated by contests over natural resources, right? People in Nigeria, people fight for oil rents and not only in Nigeria, many other places. Uh, in other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, warlords fight for appropriating uh, uh, mineral rents, for example. So basically what is the idea? Is that uh, in the absence of violent conflict, this sector is supposed to uh, respect to generate the rents and eventually GDP growth. The point is that the point is that even 10 years without violent conflict or without violent contest on these resources does not guarantee the future peace and stability of that country. So the point is that we first have to understand that the sectoral, that different sectors within the economy lead to different outcome in terms of peace. Okay, because they generate different incentives to violent conflict. Third point is, we know that, I mean, economists disagree basically on everything, but the only things we don't, we don't disagree upon is that education generates human capital and human capital is associated with prosperity in the long run. We agree on that, right? It's also a common uh, and even health Health generates productivity, future productivity of laborers. I mean, an uh, um, ill-nourished child will become a less productive, uh, ill-productive uh, laborer. Um, if you feed properly a child, a kid, he will become a good student and a good laborer. I mean, it's, everybody knows this. We agree also on this. And what's the point? The point is that the higher is the level of potential violence, that generate public spending in military, the lower will be are the lower are the uh, outlays in health and education. This is a, a common feature everywhere. In autocracies worldwide, we observe this. In democracies, we observe less of this trade-off. So basically, this um, in macroeconomy, I, we have to consider this trade-off between the relevant items of public spending in terms of growth and prosperity over time. And also because of uh, the public debt generated by a war economy, not a peace, econo a peace economy. Uh, war conflict are always associated with the public debt, the public debt instability. Um, history, in history of humankind, we can find example how empires has col have collapsed because of public debt generated by military, military, uh, military experiences. I mean, the, British, the, the, the Spanish empire, the Roman empire, okay? And also we have, uh, uh, now we have countries in among the less developed countries that now are facing the, 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 the pandemic's recession with very huge debt a, mo a huge quote of this debt has been generated by public uh, military spending in the past. And also peace economics uh, help us to understand what are the roots of violence. For example, you know, 
unemployment, inflation, do they generate rooted violence? Do they generate uh, uh, pr uh, provision of public goods? Do they generate violence or do they limit violence within societies and uh, uh, between societies? So this, these are all aspects macro that uh, contribute to understand uh, the, the, the limits, uh, the obstacles we have to create peace. And maybe last but not least, maybe is the most important, what is the target variable we use to generate this revolution in mindset? Now we have the GDP. What is the alternative for GDP when considering? We have a good alternative. There are some alternatives at the moment. One is the Human Development Index, for example, which captures some uh, aspect of well-being uh, within societies. But the point is, anyway, is still open. Uh, what are the target, about, the target variable that a policymaker should take into account? This is something that is related to macroeconomic complete. Let's go to the micro. And uh, within this framework, within this framework, framework of macro decision, what about behavior of consumers and firms? Uh, we know, in fact, from uh, now is uh, Vittori is a behavioral uh, economist and knows these knows these things much better than me. But now is uh, now there is almost a common knowledge on on on, on a fact that the script the, the the conventional script about in about uh, macroeconomic behaviors is wrong, in the sense that we we know in fact that individuals don't uh, maximize. Uh, uh, utility in terms of quantity of goods. And we also know the firms don't maximize profits only. Uh, for example, consumers, we know that uh, are equipped with the lexicographic preferences in the sense that many people now in the world are, for example, following the sustainable brands. Why? Because in their uh, ranking of preferences, they, pref they prefer to buy not only a good, a private good, but a good which respect first some environmental uh, requirements, for example, okay? Or some human rights requirements. The big challenge we have to, to, to foster, to, to lead peace into the debate is to link this the idea that consumers can choose according to, to their lexicographic preferences, take into account in their pyramid of preferences, peace related aspects. For example, as consumer, I would like to refuse to, to, to buy goods produce exploiting human rights or exploiting, uh, um, do you remember the story about the diamonds, which have been, uh, which have been uh, characterized in a movie, the famous movie, it's exactly that point. At a certain point, consumers of diamonds have, uh, have uh, thanks to a global campaign, I was starting refusing buying diamonds uh, mine in, in uh, war-torn uh, societies. This is something which should be more common in, uh, in our way because consumer can do a lot. Second point, firms. And also I'm happy that Juan Camilo is here because I have an example from Colombia. I'm sorry, I'm exploiting every <laughs> example from Colombia. Uh, that's what firms do. The firms don't... Uh, maximize profits, it's what we teach, what we have taught, but it's not true. We also know that many firms would like to add uh, some uh, common goods uh, consideration within their objective. Uh, in the world now, we have an example in the US, in Italy, and now, now also in Colombia of the benefit corporation. Benefit corporation are firms which add the common, a common goods, a public goods, to profits. That means uh, they make business, but also want to generate some social good. And uh, uh, in, in Colombia, they are uh, called uh, society, Sociedad de, de Bene, um, uh, Sociedad, I, I don't know this Spanish, I'm sorry, Juan Camilo. But anyway, just uh, released in 2019, uh, just approved the law. And uh, the president of Colombia has maintained that this kind of firms would help in sustaining peace in territories. Why? Because many of them 
could uh, intervene on the roots of, uh, of, of a conflict, like inequality, for example, by means of a new philosophy in making business, uh, or also exploitation of uh, discrimination of, of some, uh, of some, um, of some uh, uh, parts of the population. So in basic what I'm saying is that we need a novus genus of firms, which must be uh, allowed by governments to mix the profit uh, objective with, for, for shareholders, with a social good uh, uh, for stakeholders, okay? This could, could have, uh, uh, this could have uh, uh, a spillover for peace. In this respect, I think this is linked to what, what Juan Camilo said by universal good. Imagine firms that produce some uh, common goods, some universal goods, so building, uh, uh, and this could be really, really useful. This is a challenge. Changing firms, changing business, eventually changing business could lead to peace. Finally, I would present and then I have, oh, I have to finish my amount of time, sorry. Some policy implication descending from these points, only four, but there would be many, <laughs> there would be many. First of all, my brief to go was nothing but about democracy. In this respect, I have to uh, mention, uh, I also have to mention Eleanor uh, Ostrom, because basically what we know now in uh, 2020 is that majoritarian democracies are divisive. I mean, in Europe, in US, we see that, uh, we see that uh, uh, arithmetic democracies don't work properly. Democracy is not about voting. Democracy is about protection of minorities, uh, securing uh, liberties, okay? There are different types of democracy. And uh, one is consensus democracy as envisioned by uh, a political scientist called Lee, Lee Party years ago. But I mentioned this just because the different type of democracy are also crucial to manage natural resources. Since I said before that uh, um, managing of natural resources is, uh, is a crucial because uh, often, so, uh, many countries often are, uh, uh, descend are descending to war because of uh, bad handling of natural resources. Different type of democracy could uh, could lead to peace by handling properly uh, uh, democracy. Second point, that which is related to the first one, supporting so sectors which don't create incentives to violent conflict. Oil economies, so let's back to the example of diamonds to oil, oil or other natural resources. If these sectors generate incentives to war, to civil wars or to other wars, governments shouldn't support these sectors, even if they generate GDP growth in the short term. This is a big challenge. Consider that if you ask money, if you ask a credit now, after COVID to international IMF, what they would say is that they want to see the balance sheet at the end of the story, but they don't need to know what kind of, of, sub, um, of uh, uh, public spending you're doing. Okay, or at least they see they don't. But this could be, for example, including the conditionality of uh, IMF for credit facilities, for example. Take care of which, which sector you are supporting as government. Second point, if peace is a public, couple of public goods, need us to say disarmament is a public good too, because uh, uh, instruments of potential or actual violence needs, need to be minimized. In particular, a policy maker should take the balance between what does generate conflict, what does uh, generate a cost for society, and what does generate prosperity in the long run. So my proposal is to consider as a target, as a target variable, one could be Take the, don't take the GP only. Take the ratio between what you spend in education, what you spend military. Now in US, in uh, Russia, for $1 spent 
in education there is one dollar spent in military. Why? Because they are always involved in wars. In the countries that are more peaceful, in countries that are more prosperous, and uh, they, they are not involved in wars, you have that this, this ratio is, is uh, maybe is uh, between two and three. In Europe, for example, it's uh, slightly larger than two. That means that European countries uh, spend two dollars in education and one dollar in military. The idea is that we could use this ratio as policy variable in the future for each country. So this is another challenge. Second point, uh, last but not least point is about, always about disarmament and industry structure. Too many armed producers are listed in stock exchange. This means that if governments need to take care of the incentives in sectors, but they also have to consider that managers of listed companies have only one incentives, maximize the value for shareholders. I mean, maximize profits. In order, in order to decrease the number of weapons in the world, to limit and to attach security and therefore peace aspect to these companies that do exist. We need a delisting, a global campaign for the listing of armor producers in order to bring managers not to consider only profits. Finally, I'm out of time. If peace is a global institution, we need a global campaigns, but we need global institution. The risk with COVID is that uh, all international organizations, all international institutions have been delegitimized, the uh, United Nations. But in particular, what we need is to refresh global institutions like UN, in particular in this agreement to limit weapons to, to uh, foster disarmament worldwide. And uh, uh, EU, the EU should be a regional block to foster these, a build, should be a building block to foster this. Uh, thanks for your patience. I think I, I went out of time. Forgive me for this. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Raul. Uh, so very quickly, uh, I'll give the floor to Bernard for his uh, for his consideration, comments, questions, uh, requests of <laughs> whatever. Thank you, and uh, especially thank you, uh, Professor Cardenas and Caruso for uh, your contribution. I, I think I'm can speak uh, on behalf of uh, all the business and peace uh, group from the economy of Francesco that, uh, well, your contributions today will be a real kickoff for our, for our village. Uh, I think that uh, all your ideas could be really inspiring for us and, and I think will help uh, a lot uh, to define the scope of our, of our village. Um, just uh, like to start with uh, Professor Cardenas. Um, um, as you know, uh, our scientific director of, uh, of Economia Francesco, Lugino Bruni, uh, has been doing a, a lot of research about this conception of fede pública, this uh, uh, public faith or public trust uh, in the work of Antonio Genovesi. Um, and, and trying to, to compare it with uh, Adam Smith's uh, conceptions, right? So uh, on, on that regard, I'd like to ask you how you think that trust uh, with others could um, uh, live together with this uh, conception of uh, competitiveness, that it's uh, across all uh, economics, uh, handbooks, and uh, so on. Well, um, this, this, this could be a matter of a, 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 another entire session. The connection between competition, collective action, trust, is a, a very interesting and fascinating one. I mean, back from the times of Darwin, uh, for some reasons, group selection started fading out and individual selection uh, gained a, a main point and main presence in the discourse. And this has to do exactly with that. Because even from Darwin, there was a speculation about the capacity of humans to get together and collectively be competitive, if you want to put it in that way. Um, uh, and, and to summarize it, um, we have been doing some experiments in the lab precisely to show that 
groups that can face competition with other groups begin to trigger strategies of trust and cooperation within the group to try to survive with the others. And in the aggregate, everybody gains. So what I'm trying to say is that competition and collective action not necessarily can be antagonists. If the right institutions, and this is why I like Raul's points on institutions. This is a lot about institutional design. If the right institutions and incentives are set up, you can create an environment in which within communities, trust is the engine to create collective action, to create the common good around that group. And then that group is competing with other groups. And if that competition is healthy, is fair, if it is a fair competition, then everybody speak, steps up their game and everybody begin producing, for example, these collective goods. When Raul was mentioning about these processes in Colombia, in these regions, when they are trying to implement these processes of integrating businesses with the ex-combatants and so on, imagine different regions in which you begin to build intra-group within the group relationships of trust that creates the competitiveness because of the collective action within the group. And that creates that group uh, the possibility of compete with others for certain aspects that are important for them, markets, for example. Um, but what, what we see is that these, these don't have to be antagonists. Of course, the wrong institutions that create unfair competition, monopolistic competition, are not good for these traits. These are environments that uh, make trust not a good trait to create an escalation of cooperation and believing in each other and creating these relationships with suppliers, with clients, and so on. So I, I think that there's ways to understand better incentives, better institutions to create an environment in which within cooperation increases intergroup competition and everybody creates a more production of collective goods. Okay, thank you. So, so we, we can live in tranquility, just competing in a fair in a fair way, right? Exactly. If it is the type of competition that Adam Smith portrayed, I mean, if you go and if you put together the, the wealth of nations and the, the theory of moral sentiments together, then you see that you can have a thriving society in which businesses can thrive if they create the right relationships with everybody, fair relationships, trustworthy relationships. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'll just uh, move to uh, Professor Caruso uh, very, very quickly. Um, you've been talking about uh, prosperity and peace, right? As, as two uh, different uh, conceptions. But um, as you know, uh, we have Shalom, uh, the, the, the Jewish Shalom, or uh, even uh, the Greek Eirene. Uh, which have a broader sense uh, of peace that we have right now in, in, in this direction that Professor Cardenas uh, was spoken about, right? Uh, of peace as tranquility, but also as uh, well-being, as calm, as uh, serenity, safety, and also prosperity, right? So uh, I'd like to know from your uh, perspective, Professor Caruso, if, if you think that uh, um, a broader understanding of the word peace would be useful, uh, I don't know if, uh, if uh, in, a, in an academic way, uh, but uh, if, it, if it could be useful for us, uh, at least for our village, business and peace, to define uh, this end of peace, but in a broader sense. Thanks, Bernard. Um, the, um, the, this is a difficult question. Eh? This, this is a difficult question. <laughs> um, I, I, I like you mentioned the, 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 the Jewish word and the Greek word. Um, the answer would be the it depends, which is the favorite uh, answer of economists. But okay. this is true in this case. You know why? About our village. Um, I think that uh, the challenge of the village is to uh, clarify and to uh, highlight some rigorous, not so rigorous, but anyway, some uh, uh, clear cut points about peace and, eco and economy. 
because my idea of this village is that our the people of the village afterwards not all afterwards i mean in the in a continuing time would be able will be able to uh implement into uh, concrete action within their societies about uh, um, to, to concrete action towards peace. That means having a relationship with uh, policymaker or uh, with other business, uh, with other business uh, or uh, with media. Okay, so in this respect, we need to highlight clear cut points that are related to economy in order not to appear too naive to the rest of the world. Okay, mm -hmm. this is uh, sometimes which is a practical uh, objective. In uh, personal, in a personal perspective, I do believe, I do believe that it would be essential to have a broad idea of peace. I also have a broad idea of peace in the sense that uh, we can distinguish between the idea we have and the deliverable we should make. The deliverable is, uh, is a list of uh, practical things we can do, okay? But on the back, we should have a broader idea of peace. So in this respect, I do, uh, I do agree with you. It's better to have a broader concept, even if we must be aware as participants to this village that in the end, we have to deliver uh, specific, uh, peculiar, but specific, uh, uh, concrete uh, policy action, action in general, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I think that now we move to some questions, uh, Torio. Uh, um, yeah, f first a comment. Uh, from in, in the chat, there are no questions, but there are lots of uh, very nice comments and uh, grateful. There's a Helena Maruja from Portugal that says that uh, loads of gratitude regarding the topic and the presentation. And then there's a comment from Cristina Calvo from Argentina, great webinar and many, many, many others. So probably the, the two presentations were too clear <laughs> and now I'm, I'm, I'm joking but I, I have a comment uh, I don't know if you agree or not uh, about the fact that uh, the institutional design process or the institutional design uh, revolution that you uh, uh, um, I think that you think we need uh, uh, can be only based on an anthropological change, a very deep anthropological change. And uh, uh, why? Because I, I think that the um, uh, uh, the way we uh, mm, conceptualize the economic agent and the social agent in terms of, you know. Mm, Selfie just maximizing utility um, has an impact on the way we build institution, on, on the way we design institution. There's a sort of coevolution of preferences, institutions, and culture, and so on and so forth. Because you know, we we all live in a in a universe made by multiple equilibria which are driven by expectation, by the image, by expectation about others' people behavior. And uh, what we expect from others depends on the, the cultural uh, construct that we use to, um, uh, to uh, describe, to, 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 to expect something from others. And uh, uh, I think that uh, as you know, in the dialogue between neurosciences, uh, neuroscience, yes, neurosciences and uh, uh, anthropology and uh, behavioral economics and psychology, now today we we have all the knowledge that that can be used to reshape the idea of the, of uh, of uh, economic agents. Okay, we are not individual. Uh, uh, self-interest and utility maximizer. We are hyper-social. <laughs> That's the image. Of, we are a su super cooperators. Okay, and uh, 
if I think if we uh, start this cultural uh, um, uh, change process, and we can do it here in the Economy of Francesco network, okay? If we start the process, this, this, uh, this cultural change process, we can start even a uh, change that helps the markets to give values to, for example, those firms that are able to build trust. Okay, because as uh, both of you were saying, we can, as consumers, we have a, a, a very strong but uh, uh, often not uh, used power, which is the so-called uh, vote with a wallet. Okay, we can choose how to spend our money to drive changes in, in, in the way firms behave. So from the, from the demand side, there's a, a, a very strong pressure that can be exerted towards firms. And at the same time, we uh, can vote as a, uh, in, a, in, a, in our uh, you know, political system. And we can uh, try to incentive uh, um, political changes that helps those firms to work better, to face a more fair competition, as uh, Juan Camilo was saying. I don't know mm -hmm. if you agree with this picture. Uh, if, if I may, I, I, I agree with you, Vittorio. I, I think that um, this could connect nicely with the idea that Raul mentioned about the lexicographic preferences. Um, and the lexicographic preferences can be on the side of the consumers, but also in the case of the firms, in terms of the lexicographical production function. And he mentioned examples. So firms that regardless of the low price that a supplier can bring in an input to the firm, the firm can have lexicographic preferences to say, I am not purchasing this input because this input was produced within a context of violation of human rights or violation of uh, the environment rights in terms of damaging the environment. What I'm trying to say is that, there, that we need to move back to think about Kantian preferences here. It's, it's about a, a, another view that not everything is substitutable for others, that are not through the prices and preferences, that at some point in the curve of preferences of consumers, and again with firms, we can have Kantian preferences in which say, I do not purchase this just because it's not within my range of options. And that needs cultural change, that needs education, that needs deliberation. And maybe with this idea of the village, the, the, the purpose is to create that dialogue that there might be other ways of looking at this. To me, the problem is that how we teach economics. This goes back all the way from the beginning of the very first course in economics, because we are not including this substantially fundamental things about ethics, the ethics of relationship with others and the ethics of relationship with the environment, for example. And in that sense, we start from the beginning in teaching economics that we can make substitutions of everything with everything. And we are getting into a point, and I think this pandemic is bringing us these dilemmas, that we, there are no such trade-offs in terms of life saved today and life saved tomorrow because of the use of an intensive care unit or the use of a certain resource to save a firm or save a job or save a life. I think we are confronting these more powerful forces through the emotions, through the more deeper um, reflection of humans on how we value life, how we value a relationship with another one. And I think economics has to to, 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 to make some steps back and reflect on how we are teaching this economics idea from the beginning that we can just make substitutions from one input to the other one if the prices are right to make the transition. Yeah, well, Juan Camila, about this point, which is very crucial, I think, the, the way we, we teach economics, can you tell us something about, just a few words about the core project I know yes. you're involved in? Yeah. And so the, the, because of a lot of these reflections, we started um, a project of building a curricula that responds better to this. And let me give you two or three examples. History is there from the beginning. I think economics textbooks are beginning to be more and more 
or, or have been for the last few decades, a, a historic. A core is a curriculum that starts with history. The first chapter is called the capitalistic revolution. And the capitalism revolution is the revolution of the last 200 years that has made some wonderful things for human beings and has also created great inequalities and destruction of the planet. So the environment is there too from the beginning. The political economy is there from the beginning. And throughout the units, we maintain this idea that there are ideas in contestation, that there are no solved problems or puzzles within economic ideas, and that there are different perspectives. And it maintains the tools in terms of some mathematical tools, some analytical tools, but at the same time, it builds on a more historically based analysis and where power is back present. And when, when I say back is because in the origins of economics, which is the daughter of philosoph moral philosophy and political philosophy, history was crucial. Uh, it's back there. And it's back there with behavioral economics from the very beginning too. So behavioral economics is not at the end like a topic uh, or an advanced topic is from the beginning that humans are more complex, are more uh, uh, difficult to understand in how they behave. So this, this core project is that idea to build a new curriculum. And finally, it's been translated in several languages. Now it's available in French, Italian, Spanish. We're about to launch the Spanish complete version as we speak and English, and it's free. It's open and free, but you can buy it also in print. So it's a, it's a great project and it was written by dozens of economists around the world. It's not a single author project, it's many authors around the world. So if you look, look up CORE, the economy, C-O-R-E, the economy, you will find the project quickly in, on the web and, and hopefully this will enrich this, this, this idea of improving the way we teach economics. Great, great, thank you. Uh, Raul, you do you want to add something about the? Um, two two quick things. Uh, first of all, I also totally agree with you, and uh, I also second the the comment by Juan Camilo. Uh, basically, what we are saying is that uh, whenever we introduce uh, identity within economics, basically we we rediscover that uh, human beings are equipped with. Uh, emotion, per perception, Im Im images they have about the other. So that's, uh, of course, it's something which uh, has been uh, um, has been forgotten for years. So I totally, I totally um, agree with this. I also like that um, to highlight, uh, I also would like to highlight that unfortunately these identity economics uh, or these, the psychological preferences uh, in uh, individual behavior have a, a dark side. So what we need to know is also that there is a dark side. I mean, um, uh, I, I wrote some years ago an, um, a chapter uh, on uh, the evil of the last century, the, uh, the Nazis, okay? About the crowd that followed um, Adolf Hitler, and it was, uh, and of course, it was based basically on this idea of identity economics. And most people at that time in Germany uh, created, the, supported the system just to show the other people they were the good Nazis. Okay, they also had some lexicography preferences with respect to business, for example. Everything was good, but uh, at the condition that. Uh, uh, the condition was that uh, that good shouldn't have been Jewish produced by produced by Jewish, for example, which is a, is a nonsense in economics. Uh, but it, because it was uh, it was de descending from uh, from uh, from identity or needs identity. So the idea is that uh, uh, we must be aware that uh, these mindsets that considers this uh, more realistic and complex, uh, uh, you, uh, the complex reality of human beings has also a dark side. And when uh, using this, uh, we, are, we have also to consider what could be worse. This is, my, uh, this is my concern in this respect. About teaching economics, I think that is a, I didn't know this project, it's a great project. Uh, the point is that in this respect, I want to say that I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because the younger generation colleagues uh, now they are all uh, they have studied 
behavioral economists. For example, I didn't study behavior. I I, I started reading behavior behavioral economics a few few years ago. Okay, because I, I'm a, I'm a professional scholar. But uh, now students have course have uh, lectures of behavioral uh, economics uh, in uh, in many many universities. So in this respect, I'm optimistic. Uh, and uh, we must be optimistic, it's in particular now. But now we have, uh, as Vittorio said, uh, much more knowledge than, uh, than, than before, in particular thanks to experimental economics, for example, new neuroeconomics that is taking, uh, is taking momentum, is gaining momentum this time. So, uh, I, I, so in the first, I agree, but the concern is the dark side. Second, the teaching economics makes me more rot mix for the future. Okay, thank you, thank you, Raul. There's a uh, there are a few few questions. One is from uh, uh, many more questions now. <laughs> um, uh, the first one is from uh, Laura Souza from Portugal. Uh, I don't know if I'm translating well because as it, it was originally in in Portuguese, then translated in Italian, then I'm trying to translate in uh, in uh, in English. Is a it's a comment, you know? It's a um, Laura asks if we are um, if we are neglecting the fact that, that in uh, in um, uh, transition countries or in peripheral countries. Uh, violence is some. It's a, it's a kind of necessary condition for development. I don't know if in, in a normative way or in a descriptive way. Okay, it, 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 she asked if, if we are not neglecting this point, uh, which she she takes as um, granted. Then there's a uh, there's another question by Tommaso Reggiani that probably some of you knows. Uh, um, uh, Tommaso writes, following Vittorio's reflection, consumers have the great power to reward peaceful businesses, but how political institutions can motivate or promote peace-oriented entrepreneurs? Mm. Okay, there's, there's another, another question by uh, um, Christiana Abreu. Uh, greetings and thanks for your explanation, but please next time invite a woman. Okay, she's right. <laughs> She's perfectly right. Thank you, Christian, for these remarks. But in uh, in the coordinating team uh, of the, the village, there's lots of very valid and uh, helpful and uh, strong and motivated uh, women. But you're right. Next time we will we'll try to, to be more uh, inclusive on, on this. Um, Okay, uh, if you want to quickly answer this question, and then I have uh, another one, a final one, because we are running out of time. If you can give us two titles for the groups that we can form in our village to go deeper in, in to explore and go deeper on uh, some of the uh, topics that emerged in the conversation today. Mm -hmm. Go first. Probably Raul should take the first question, right? On on the causality between violence and development. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, about the first question about transition. I, I thanks for this question because transition countries are uh, highlights something which need we need to remember. The there's the legacy of violence in transition country is so pervasive. I've been uh, many times and I taught in Russia, in Poland, and now I teach in Albania, in many transition countries. And we know that uh, it's, uh, mm, it's evident that uh, uh, former communist uh, uh, countries, which were characterized by dictatorships, and so the means exploitation of, pot even of both potential and actual violence uh, on um, every day basically um, still have st still have uh, uh, still have some informal 
and in both informal and formal institution that prevent uh, development, that prevent a peaceful, a peaceful development. In the sense that uh, if uh, the comment is violence is uh, um, necessary for growth, to some extent it must be said that violence appears to be connected with growth. But this is not exactly the case. In the sense that uh, um, violence can appear to be uh, some kind of necessary condition at a certain point in time. But is not true is not true in most cases, it's not true that's a factor which is associated to growth. It's true that growth and development start, uh, start um, uh, expounding their, uh, their uh, effects. And of course, violence cannot disappear uh, overnight. Most economies, I, I, told, I, I, I tell my students, the most economies in the world are dual. But uh, dual in uh, uh, taking into account coin in the sense that there are sectors, groups of people, uh, business which are uh, surrounded, affected by violence, and uh, business uh, groups which are not so affected by violence. The idea is that in, within any society, there is some kind of contest between what is surrounded and affected by violence, and what is not. Of course, we have to limit what is surrounded by violence. For example, I come from, I'm from Italy, right? We know that Italy is uh, among the G7 countries, but we also know that there are some territories which are largely characterized by violence, which is an informal institution, where Italy is a country which is also famous for mafia, okay? Uh, this does not mean that Italy has no development. It means that any economy is dual. And to do what, what is the point? The point is that we have to consider this from the very beginning in order to make the appropriate policy, poly, economic policies to restrain the violence affected sectors, the violent affected groups, and so on. So it's not the case that violence is associated with growth, that violence appears to be associated only because we cannot delete violence overnight. And uh, uh, transition economy are another example uh, in this respect. Uh, I also replied to Tommy Reggiani uh, quickly. I go back to, to, to what I've said, what the policy, uh, a policy maker can do to support peace-related entrepreneurs. First of all, as I told you, we need a novus genus of firms. And uh, social entrepreneur, benefit entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs uh, with a focus on social good. We can find diversity and variety in this, but this is the first thing that the policymakers have to do, to provide potential entrepreneur and current entrepreneur with uh, legislative instruments to, pers to, 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 uh, to pursue public uh, common goods and the eventually peace. Um, I stop here. Thank you, Raul, Juan Camilo. No, I, I agree with Raul, uh, Raul's points. Uh, in general, this causality and the proposal in peace economics to reverse the causality, that peace is a creator of uh, development and well-being, I think is, is well put in, in that first uh, either statement or question. I, I think he, he developed that. In terms of, of Tomaso's question, I think governments can do many things. Governments are uh, usually wealthy to regulate and to uh, set up, and through that regulation, change incentives through subsidies or taxes. And governments sometimes create uh, themselves possibilities for production. Uh, they are not very good at that. At least the historical record is not necessarily the best on that one. But in terms of understanding how consumers and humans in general, either as consumers or managers of firms or owner of firms, they have these social preferences. And, and probably the governments what need to understand is that they need to see better how those preferences react in terms of what we are saying. And, and to put it in practice, what I am trying to, to convey here is the idea that um, governments can understand because they have access to information on 
which industries and which chain supply chains are related to processes that create either more peace or more violence. And in that sense, they can, through their, their hands, the, the, the fist that the government has to impose either uh, regulations, prohibitions, or subsidies, or, or taxes, uh, try to guide a little bit of the supply chain towards activities that are more related to peace than to violence. And, and the government sometimes is itself involved in those chains. Um, so maybe maybe the, the reflecting on how to guide better uh, so that these lexicographic preferences of consumers and, and, and firms can be oriented towards um, neglecting and rejecting certain activities as a way for the government to, to begin in, uh, entering into that. The, the problem is that the governments have very short-term horizons. The governments have short-term horizons because of the political cycles. So in that sense, it's a, if a government is obsessed with a certain metric, for example, growth rate, or even employment rates in the short run, then they might be tempted to, to guide the economy for short-term returns that give them political gains in their four or five year cycles. And that might mean getting involved in activities that create more violence than peace. Um, extractive resources, uh, mining industries are very often in many of our countries involved with certain illegal activities that create violence. So the, there's a, a difficulty there in terms of the time horizon that governments need to face here. And hopefully citizens get more involved in electing also um, political leaders that have preferences for longer time horizons. But, but this is in the political arena and we can select between different political campaigns in which they favor the short run or the long run. Okay, thank you. I, I think we have to, to close now really. And um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch and um, we'll, we'll decide how to organize the, the, the works in our groups and the themes that um, can, be, can be further developed and further uh, explored. I want, to, I want to finish with, uh, uh, with a question that it's also a, um, I think, a, a, a very nice comment because uh, Carlos uh, Antonio Reyes, he uh, asked why there's no online school on this subject to train the new generation, the new economics, that's fundamental for beginners. So uh, it's a kind of an invitation for uh, <laughs> for for us to you know to to spread and to make uh, all this uh, material available to to a larger number of, of people. And uh, it goes with the optimism uh, uh, embraced by by Raúl and but also me and uh, uh, I think Juan Camilo and Bernat. Okay, thank thank you very much. I have uh, the last uh, uh, the last um, note to give, uh, which refers to the next the next two seminars on this series. The, the next one will be on Wednesday, the twenty second, four p.m. Assisi time, Italian time, and the title is "Dark Waters: Business and Environmental uh, Responsibility." with uh, uh, Robert Billot and uh, John Mandel. Uh, and then there's uh, another one, second one on uh, next, uh, following uh, Wednesday the 29th with uh, Mariana Mazzucato. Uh, she's an economist from UCL in uh, the University College of London, but she's also one of uh, the consular of the prime minister here in Italy. And uh, she's working on the so-called phase two, the after pandemic, uh, uh, you know, reconstruction mm -hmm. phase. So I think both of them, both of the, 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 the seminar will be extremely interesting. Um, nothing more to say, but uh, thank you, uh, uh, you all, uh, the, the audience, all the participants, and especially the, our speaker, Juan Camilo Cardenas, uh, Raul Caruso, and uh, Bernat Celas. Uh, thank you very much and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much.